Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And the texts for June 21st, 2020 are the complimentary Old Testament reading is Jeremiah 27 through 13. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is Genesis 21, 8 through 21. The Psalm is selected verses from Psalm 69. The second reading is Romans 6, 1b through 11, and the gospel is Matthew 10, 24 through 39. A disciple is not above the teacher, and I think Matt puts that on all his syllabi. Isn't that true, Matt? I might start doing that. I think my students would just laugh at it, though, but that's okay. <laughs> this is a week with a lot of suffering. <laughs> a lot of suffering in these texts, isn't there? Um, Matthew, I should put this on the top of my syllabus. Don't be afraid. <laughs> well, the fear not is repeated three times. Uh, and I think, that, I think that is significant because, uh, because you have sort of this, you have the naming, and I think that's the dynamic here. That's the tension here of, of naming, the, naming the suffering and naming the, the reality. But, it's, but uh, at the same time, you have the interjections of fear not uh, in verse 26, 28, and 31. And to what extent uh, there's an, I, I think the commentary talked about this, that there, the activity of naming then is an, is, is an activity of combating fear. Uh, and so uh, fear has a tendency to whatever that whatever that fear ends up being um, there's something there is something about calling it out that uh, that uh, I don't, it doesn't necessarily it doesn't eliminate the fear necessarily but it, it it's it, at least you know what you're fearful of uh, and I think there is something about that that um, that that so much of our um, our lives are in that in that place of of reality and fear and uh and but that's what we get we get that reminder of 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 fear not and i think that's as again we we talked about this last week with the math these matthew texts about these um these moments of comfort <laughs> or blessing or uh that we get throughout and here we have those again about uh our even the hairs on your head are counted. Aren't you of more value than any sparrows? And so um, we listen for those. We listen for those promises then of 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 God's regard for us and God's uh, God's presence with us, even in the midst of of naming um, naming that of which we are afraid. There's no promise here. You won't get hurt. I mean, there's no promise here, like, you know, don't worry, none of that's going to uh, be damaging to you. It's just rather don't be afraid of those who can kill the body uh, because they can't kill the soul. Um, language in here about this, the reality of, of conflict, which then comes to the, comes to a kind of a point of climax when Jesus says, take up your cross, which is what there's a symbol that <laughs> there's a symbol that not only acknowledges there might be trouble, uh, but you're expecting it, right? That's kind of where you've been brought. So it's a an interesting passage that that don't fear is the refrain. Um, it's it's rather don't fear that you're going to be defined by your suffering, or don't fear that those with the power to do harm are going to finally reign triumphant one day. It's the the, the, the sense of confidence in here isn't I'm going to be okay. Uh, or this is going to happen to somebody else and not me. The confidence is solely in, I think, who God is. This this is a weird, this is a weird passage because it doesn't really hold together um, in the way that other sections of the narrative do. It seems like this is a bunch of random. I shouldn't say random, but here's a bunch of unrelated sayings that are held together. It's sort of like, oh, and here's a bunch of other things Jesus also said, and and these are bullet points that I don't think. I don't think that in the way I read, I don't think they lead one to another and hold together in any sort of sequence. Um, uh, I'm open to being uh, corrected on that, but it's, uh, you know, you know, so that you, on the one hand you get, um, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. 
and then you get those who find their lives will lose it. You know, um, whoever loves mother and father is not worthy. You know, so that it seems to me that it's almost like, as a preacher, don't try to hold this all together. Maybe pick one or two of these things to build uh, build your sermon around. But like I said, happy to be corrected. I don't think a preacher has to necessarily say, look at all the coherence here, but um, but this is still part of his larger missionary speech, which ironically concludes without anybody actually being sent out. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, this long speech, but it's, you know, you sometimes see in, in, in editors add to Bible translations, assorted sayings of Jesus like over a, over a, a paragraph or two. Um, you know, and who knows where these come from. That I, This probably is a, a, a construction of the gospel author. I'm not going to go to my grave over that, but it probably is. But I, I think it's, it's not Q. have a sense. Pardon not me? Not Q. It's not Q. Is this? Um, she I wasn't serious, this. Matt. She wasn't oh. serious. Don't answer that question. I could if I wanted to. But I'm going to choose not to and just move on. I'm just going to move on. I do think there is a kind, I mean, the fact that it all comes in one passage, I think kind of makes a nice challenge to the preacher to say, what's, what's going on here? What are some, some themes? An analogy that pops up for me in this one, and, and, and I don't know, but uh, I read uh, this uh, idea of, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to be, bring a sword. Uh, in the midst of all of these random other pithy, um, statements uh, in a sense of um, sometimes before you can truly be healed, you have to do surgery. And so that there is a healing that takes place in the midst of a recognition of the suffering, the pain, the brokenness. Uh, and so that the sword uh, is not um, a, and, and I'm reading this against the don't be afraid of the one who can't kill the soul. Um, the sword is that um, sh um, uh, shaving away, I messed up my analogy on that, but that, that carving away of, the, um, of, of what needs to be taken out. And um, it, it's a different way of pulling all of those together, Ralph, um, if, if you're not looking to that that way. I want to jump in there. Uh, I have a, first of all, I like the rhetorical move you're making as somebody who's had over uh, 20 full under knife surgeries. But um, I want to, um, I'm going to make the argument that based on the parallel in Luke where it's, I have not come to, uh, where he says, um, I've not come to bring peace, but division. And then like the division of the family that follows that the sword here is not to be taken uh, so much as violence, but as as the symbol of division. I especially, um, in my own teaching on the Old Testament, I am against readings of scripture that promote violence. And in this particular context that we're in, uh, where we've had um, violence following, following the state-sponsored violence of uh, police brutality, then there's been other violence. And I've seen people quote both this and also quote Jesus turning over of the, t of the, of the money changers as Jesus uh, promoting violence. I'm speaking only for myself for that I reject the use of scripture for the promotion of violence, especially because I've seen it done uh, with Joshua and judges in the Old Testament. And so I just want to get that out there for my own sake, but um, I want to totally support you in 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 that. And that was um, that was that was the uh, that was the idea of um, um, the idea of of the surgery, um, um, not having had it, but having to consider it um, is that it's a consideration for healing. And so sometimes there has to be division. Um, but that division, I'm with you on that, Ralph. That division is not, from my vantage point, it's not permission to be violent. It is permission or it, it is a call to separate. 
I think, yeah, and I think one, one thing that might, uh, one of the ways that I view that particular uh, phrase in verse 34, it's hard for me to separate that out from verse 38, um, that uh, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And so the cross becomes this dividing line uh, if you will. And um, Warren Carter has uh, some really good, uh, I think a really wonderful phrase that I wanted to quote here. To take up the cross is to identify with those who threaten the empire. And, uh, and so that, you know, this, this is one of those, this is one of those passages that really, as we talked about, can get misused and abused, as can take up the cross to become sort of like any sort of trivial burden of some sort. And that's not what's happening here, a little hardship here and there. Uh, that this is, when we think of the totality of what the cross meant of shame and pain and social rejection and violence and humiliation, and, uh, and that, that taking up the cross is to side with those persons who stand up against empire. And so that really does then, then connect with some of the things that you, Rolf, Rolf and Joy are talking about with what, what's at stake in following Jesus um, is, going to be, is going to be a, a sense of, of division, which of course is what we get to in the familial language as well but it i think i think we, if we bring if we bring verse 38 into it and say this is all we know where this is going to lead and and the cross is uh the cross has much more to do with um with these realities than we might want to admit <laughs> i know you probably want to get in here matt but i really appreciate that caroline because in the reality of the moments that we are living in these past months, uh, it is siding against the empire. And so the idea that empire invites us to take arms, Ralph, in, invites us to go to war, invites us to be terrorists, uh, to side with Jesus, to take up our cross, is really to say, no, in my vulnerability, I am stronger than you because of Jesus Christ. Matt, that was Matt. A, you if you want to get in there. It's all good. Everything sounds good. We could talk about how this, this is a, a good example if you want to see the ways, um, if you want to contrast a Mathean use of Q with a Lucan use of Q which uh, it would be fascinating stuff if you guys, if you all want to go there. Oh my gosh, what have I done? Maybe we'll save that for- What have I done? What have I done? Maybe we'll save that for Christmas Eve this year or something like that, <laughs> a more appropriate time. But Make a note of that. It is. I, I'll just add one more thing. I think, um, I think Warren Carter's reading of Matthew is especially helpful for, um, for white Christianity in the 21st century. I think, I think to think about this in the first century, it's not just saying challenge the logic of empire, it's also a way of identifying, of asking the church to identify itself with those whom the empire understands as expendable. See what I mean? It's, I'm, I'm not so sure that, that this was Jesus' way of telling his followers to um, to live a different kind of, of resistance, but to recognize that the kind of life Jesus lived, which yes, challenges the logic of empire in a number of ways, but also is threatening simply because of the way in which he goes to certain people and redefines the worth of people who are thought to be worthless. That that as well makes you odd, makes you peculiar, and makes you um, liable to be uh, exploited and counted among those as well. So it's Yes, it's stand up, Warren Carter, but it's also look around and see others. We should talk about Jeremiah 20 because Jeremiah, speaking of suffering, speaking of <laughs> people, people who, uh, who could use a hand, uh, Jeremiah is one of those. Oh, I like this. I, I, like, I like Jeremiah kind of complaining that 
God has found Jeremiah's weak spots and exploited them. <laughs> like, you knew I cared. Yeah, you know, this is one of the so-called uh, laments of Jeremiah, where he just is angry with God for the fact that God called him to be a prophet. And then for almost the entire of his prophetic ministry, which, you know, lasts 40 years, gives him nothing but bad news to say. So he's forced to shout violence and destruction. That is a summary for his announcement of the calamity to come. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he doesn't like it. I don't know that this, maybe this, maybe somebody would actually want to preach on this, but for, for those preachers who feel absolutely compelled to speak an unpopular word right now in this context, and it might cost you your job, or you might destroy a Christian community because of the way you do it. Uh, this, is, this is a word where you have a fellow sufferer uh, in Jeremiah with whom to um, bond, but um, you know, it's uh, it, it it certainly removes the uh, the romanticism from being the uh, prophet of resistance to the empire. As does Psalm sixty nine as well, correct? In terms of uh, somebody suffering for what appears to be no good reason except their uh, fidelity to God, right? Yeah, I mean, I have, I'm a little suspicious of um, Psalm 69 in that sense, but, uh, you know, that is, um, how, to, how that is, yeah, first, yes of all, this, this Psalm is a response to Jeremiah in the, in the complimentary uh, Old Testament set of readings. So yeah, it's, it's picked for that way. Sometimes, you know, um, Anyone who says, oh, I'm suffering because I'm the only one faithful, I kind of go, really? But so anyway, that's what, what I meant by I'm a little bit suspect of self-justifying narratives. But um, yeah, this is, um, it's certainly picked that way. Could a community read it though and Absolutely. pluralize it? Yeah, and the community could also read it as the reading of somebody else in response to them, right? I mean, that is whenever the, the so-called, um, you know, imprecatory Psalms, um, sometimes I invite students to ask who in the world is praying this right now because of you or us. Wow. I wanna, you, I know that it is paired up with uh, the Jeremiah, but um, can it be paired up also with uh, the Genesis text here? Um, in the sense of, you know, this is the least, when, we, when we're in the midst of this uh, uh, Ishmael Hagar story, it, it's the least likely um, person who's actually shamed and yet is blessed by God. Yeah, it could be. I mean, the, 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 psalm, uh, the psalm that goes with Genesis 21 is Psalm 86. But yeah, this, I mean, this, this would fit. Let's talk about that text though. Uh, talk about a bad news bit of text, uh, the Genesis 21. And by let's talk about it meant, what was a, one of the other three of you say something? <laughs> that was an invitation. Um, I, um, I didn't jump right in at first because um, there's also the good news in the fact that this is a blessing of all the world. And uh, the commentary does a wonderful job of reading that, uh, reading it from that perspective, um, which I think sometimes we need to do that, that this is where God is offering the same blessing uh, as is to, um, uh, to, to Isaac. And uh, as um, the commentary says uh, that, um, I, I lost my place on this, but, but, a, but a recognition that, that um, uh, Hagar and Ishmael are not going to be forgotten, which means no one is forgotten um, in, in, in God's economy. Yeah, it's such a hard text, uh, which needs time and care. I think uh, the one, it's a great story about God's fidelity to Hagar and her son. 
it's also a really interesting story about Sarah. I, let's, say, let's say Sarah and Abraham. They're Abraham's complicit here. I don't like this the story about about Sarah, but it does push because it, it's so shocking. Like we all say, well, who would do something like this? Even if this is a kind of manumission that goes bad, or you know, whatever. Um, but it does make us ask that question, right? Who are the people that that inconvenience or threaten us to the extent that they become expendable to us? To use that that term again, right? Where where I mean, Sarah doesn't say. I don't give a damn what happens to them. <laughs> um, like it's not clear that she knows she's perhaps consigning them to their death, but they have no place in her household. They don't mean a thing to her as far as we can tell. And the, the reason for that appears to be a kind of perceived threat or, or, and that, that goes to then a perceived lack of value or lack of dignity. And, so it's it's worth sitting with that for a while and thinking about complicity as as well. I think at least it is for me. I think that's why I appreciated this uh, particular commentary because uh, it 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 acknowledges that um, while um, th it does exactly what you're saying, Matt, in the sense that, um, or, or at least what I heard as you were saying that, in the sense that um, protecting ourselves or taking care of ourselves can be threatening for someone else. And for us to read this where um, Sarah isn't, you know, she isn't um, intentionally saying, you know, I want the worst to happen to you, but because she's so concerned about taking care of her own, she is ignoring the fact that this is about to happen. And, and that becomes a hard word for us to say in our context, yes, you don't mean to forget about the poor or to uh, exhibit what will be called racism, and yet you're ignoring the realities that you are allowing to happen. You're not attending to that is doing the very thing that is going to cost them their life. And, and I, I, I think that time that you're talking about, I would point folks to uh, the commentary. I can't say Amanda's last name, but I would point to the commentary because I think she invites that kind of um, pause. Ben Coisen. Uh She's a friend of mine, very, very good Old Testament scholar. I want, um, building on everything you guys have said, I mean, I certainly think that to try to make this the story of a uh, manumission gone wrong is an, an apologetic move. And I know you weren't uh, signing off on that, Matt. That just doesn't work. Um, that this, so the most famous, maybe one of the most famous essays of the last half century for Old Testament studies is um, called Just the Sister Away by Renita Weems. So essentially, uh, you know, all the male scholars for centuries mostly paid attention and called it the Abraham cycle. Then the white feminists came along and said, huh, funny, you guys don't pay attention to Sarah. What about her? Then Renita Williams, an African-American, said, huh, all you white women pay attention to Sarah and don't pay attention to Hagar. What about her, the child of the slave, right? So it's a brilliant essay. Exactly. And she says, um, Hagar needed a sister, and Sarah wasn't a sister to her. And uh, it's just a brilliant essay. You can find it probably anywhere on the web. Um, and there's a great moment in this. It's, it's, it's really about the overall cycle and then God's faithfulness, as Matt has already talked about. But there's a brilliant moment in the text. So uh, Hagar puts down her um, child under the bush, her son, and she goes away and crawls under her own, into her own place of suffering so that she doesn't have to see the death of her son. And, she, and then it says at the end of verse 16, she lifted up her voice and wept. And the next line is, and God heard the voice of the boy. Right now, of course, uh, the thing to miss is, wait, it's she that's crying. Why, why does the text say, he heard the voice of the boy? Well, because he heard, God heard, um, Ishmael, he heard, that is God. That's the boy's name. The boy's name is God heard. And so that's hence the bump in the text as the rabbis would talk about it. And uh, so that you get the fidelity of God and God's, God continues the promise God had made to Abram and Sarah in Genesis 12 and 15, 
and gives it to also then to Hagar's son, I will make a great nation of him, one of the founding, uh, one of the founding promises. All right, okay. we need to move on. Uh, you were gonna, uh, t were you gonna just move me on, Ca uh, Caroline? To no, uh, I would no, Romans. just one no, just one comment about that. And that you know, Sarah's uh, Sarah's concern. I mean, I I think verse ten is uh, verse ten and eleven are, are verses that are well worth our time to sit in for a really, really, really extended period and say what is going on there. Because one of the things that uh, one of the things that, you know, kind of a subterranean theme, I think that's happening is a, is what you just said, what you just said, Rolf, is a, uh, to what extent there is a, um, uh, a distrust in, in what God promised. Uh, and so, yeah, I know God, I know you promised that God, but I'm worried that now there's some competition to that. And so I'm going to, you know, I, let, let me make sure that I can make you, let, let me make sure that I can clear the deck so that you can make good on your promises. And so it's not, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on with the human condition, but very much so um, Sarah's own, uh, Sarah's own understanding of who God is. Um, and that, and then we come back with the story of God's, you know, uh, when God said to, when God said to Abraham, you'll have, you know, you'll have, um, you'll have descend, you know, as descendants, as many as the stars, um, nobody imagined that there'd be, you know, even two sons involved. So I think it's, I think it's a really a critical aspect of, of Sarah's own navigation of who this God is and what God, how God will actually make good on God's promises. Yeah, let me just jump in really fast. That's so helpful. That theme is throughout Genesis. That is, uh, that is, who's going to inherit what? You know, the fight between, uh, Jacob and Esau, who's going to inherit and between their parents of who wants which son to inherit. But then also uh, the whole issue with Judah's uh, sons, Omar, Omar, not Omar. Um, it's Sheila and Onan, and I forgot the first ones. Uh, uh, but that is the whole worry about inheritance is what causes Onan to sin. And then you get Jacob, uh, Joseph and his older brothers about the inheritance, you know, and that's a theme throughout Genesis, which always, almost always reveals sin. But let's jump ahead to Romans uh, before we sign off for those people who are doing uh, 16 weeks in Romans, which is, you know, what I hope to do this summer. Caroline, know what this text is about? Q. What? Baptism. Q. What? Baptism. There's no Q here. This is... Oh. <laughs> You. Oh, yeah, I get it now. No, All it's right. partly yeah. about baptism. It's partly about that's what, baptism. That's what, that's what I'm going to read this summer. I'm going to read Q. Oh, I'm going to check it out of the Luther Seminary Library, and I'm going to use that as my devotional reading. I have a commentary um, on Q up here. Yeah, I, I, that's, that, that's, I'm going to skip all the lectionary readings and just read Q. Anybody with me? Bible study on Q. All right, never mind. You were saying it's about baptism and... Are you going to charge money for that Q Bible study, or is that going to be free? I think that should probably be free since there's okay. no cue to be found. <laughs> well, it's probably about baptism. This idea of being baptized into Christ's death and also then sharing in his, in his uh, future resurrection and glory. This is, I'll, I'll say it now, so I have to say it again in the next however many weeks we're in Romans, right? This is the heart of Paul's gospel is to participate in or with Christ, to be in Christ, to participate life, death, resurrection. That's, um, just crucial for him. And that's not like, quote unquote, joining the church, right? It's, I look, I did air quotes here for our video viewers. Uh, that's about being brought into the life of God through Christ uh, and sharing in that, not just by yourself, but with all the people of God. Uh, and then it's horrible stuff about sin, which we can talk about as well. But sin is not just the the list of things I've done wrong or the list of things I should have done but didn't do, sin is an enslaver. Sin is a, a colonizer that um, doesn't just hold on to me, but that enlists me in its work of enslaving others as well. So, so what's the logic of connection there, Matt? That is because, uh, because of the power of sin, the only way out of it is to be joined to the death of Christ. And that is a real experience that then requires me to die to myself. 
Yeah. Did you say the logic there, or the, I mean the, the 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 connection there? I think for yeah. Paul, it's for Paul, it's the death of Jesus is not a sacrifice or about forgiveness primarily. First and foremost, it's a deliverance. It's so at least here in, in Rome and certainly in Galatians, it's transference from the oppression of sin to freedom of now belonging to Christ. Now we'll get uh, a lot of slavery language next week, I believe, and that's got its own stuff we're gonna have to talk about and work out. But it is this idea that you belong entirely to sin uh, and sin is a cruel master that doesn't just mess you up, but uses you to mess up others as well. And so it's the, you know, what's the escape from that? Paul doesn't explain why or how the death of Jesus frees us, but he insists that it does. And that partly what that does is it's a dying to this old way of life. It's not just simply sin has been negotiated with or that our freedom has been bought, but that you've had to die to that and get a new start 